As society continues to develop and advance its understanding of the world, many who look towards the works of the supernatural as an explanation for unexplained phenomenons steadily decline. History, particularly when religion was the striving force in earlier centuries, has been plagued by events supposed to be caused by supernatural forces. Supernatural phenomenons are uncommon as the occurrences within them may have been misperceived or many who witness as such lack comprehension or reasoning to explain such an event. Now of course, when we're talking about the supernatural, I'm referring to a manifested force beyond the scientific understanding. Mythologies that depict a supernatural manifestation include ghosts, demonic possessions, witches, and other prevalent phenomena that fall under this category. And we have precedents in our history of events that tell the tale of unfortunate people being mass persecuted for alleged supernatural abilities or conspiring with supernatural forces like the devil. However, it largely depends on the audience where they're ideologically religious, superstitious, or mostly interested in the supernatural. Perhaps, who knows, but back then, Merely telling people of your own volition or witnessing a supernatural phenomenon has its fair share of consequences, especially for those who were accused of witchcraft and persecuted without in-depth scrutiny from these accusations. And to that, Salem, Massachusetts was no exception to this, given its unfortunate history with mass accusations of witchcraft and eventual trial persecution of many innocents. Events in the 17th century where Salem was riddled with witch hysteria is a tale for the fortunate listeners of the unfortunate sufferers. Located 65 kilometers outside of Plymouth, the Namkin colony was founded by a group of colonists led by a man named Roger Cunnant from Cape Ann. The territory, as its name suggests, was founded within the native territory of Nam Kig. Much like other colonies that started in New England, the colony faced many struggles under a covenant, namely famine, disease, and encounters with the Nam Kig natives. In 1628, the Massachusetts Bay Company sent out John Endicott to the Nam Kig colony in June of the same year, where he and his wife and 50 Puritans on board the New England vessel Abigail was under direct orders by the company to replace Roger Cunnant as soon as they arrived at the colony. The Abigail would not arrive at the colony until two months later on September 6th, 1628. Endicott met with Roger Cunnant and informed him of the company's interest in the colony, and was given compensation of land for his deeds and leadership. Graciously, Cunnant agreed to the terms and stepped down as the leader of the colony, allowing Cunnant to take over. Nam Kig's plantation workers and those who arrived from the Abigail cooperated in part to John and Cunnan's diplomacy and reasoning. Due to the peaceful transition of leadership and control from Cunnan to Endicott, the colony was renamed to Salem, the Hebrew word for peace. Salem was then incorporated by the Massachusetts Bay Colony when it was established in 1629 and made John Endicott as the governor of the Salem colony. As New England and her colonies grew throughout the mid to late 1600s, Many Puritans migrated from Europe due to many factors stirred back at home, which led to a predominant population of Puritans. Further migration came as a result of the war campaign in the late 1680s by King William III and Queen Mary II, which displaced many refugees within the county of Essex and specifically within the Salem colony. To a lot of Puritans, they believed that every occurrence was a sign of God's mercy or judgment, even going on to believe the occult and supernatural. Many are of the perception that witches allied themselves with the devil to carry out his evil deeds and spread harm such as death and sickness. Throughout the 1680s, as refugees were taken in, Salem's resources were placed on heavy strain, provoking issues for the wealthy and to those who grew dependent on agriculture. Salem residents grew resentment on the wealthy, specifically with Reverend Samuel Paris due to his rigid and greedy nature, who became the community's first ordained minister in 1689. As the Salem colony experienced complications from harsh conditions of winter to a growing community of distrust in 1690, many Puritans blamed these events as the work of the devil and sought desperately for any signs of hope. This would slowly culminate into a hysteria of distrust and fear, and eventual peak would come to their fruition in 1692. In the winter season of 1692, 
Two young girls by the names of Elizabeth Betty Paris and her cousin Abigail Williams, the daughter and niece of Reverend Samuel Paris respectively, were described to have come with symptoms of convulsion. Testimonies detailed that both girls produced strange sounds, threw objects around and contorted themselves into unusual positions. The community's physician, William Griggs, examined both girls but found nothing physical out of the ordinary. He gave an opinion that both were somehow affected by the devil, an evil hand as he alleged that the afflicted caused them to suffer under these symptoms. By February 1692, Salem's magistrates Jonathan Corwin and John Hathorne pressured both afflicted girls to give false testimonies and accused three women within Salem for their afflictions, Tichuba, Sarah Osborne, and Sarah Good. Starting off with Tichuba, she was Reverend Samuel Paris' slave before he was an ordained minister in 1689 and was one of the first alleged witches accused by the afflicted girls. Secondly, Sarah Osborne was a widowed wife fighting for ownership over the land after her husband's passing. She sought to inherit the land for herself from her own two kids, who were the heirs when they reached a certain age. And lastly, unlike Sarah Osborne and Tichuba, Sarah Good was considered by Salem residents as appalling within the community. She was a homeless beggar who had been in two divorces and was described as a filthy, bad-tempered, and strangely detached from the rest of the village. Her reputation as a homeless beggar made her an unsavory person within the Salem community. While it is arguable to ascertain the exact reasons why these three women specifically were accused of witchcraft, here's what I've been able to learn based on the evidence I've been able to gather. Sarah Good was accused of her rejection of puritanical expectations of self-control and discipline when she chose to torment and scorn children instead of leading them towards the path of salvation. Sarah Osborne was believed to have her own self-interest in mind when she rarely attended churches, but was accused mainly of her attempts to inherit her husband's land from her own children, which many found to be distasteful. But it was most likely that the powerful Putnam family, who went against Osborne's attempt to inherit the land, may have had her accused. And as for Tichuba, she was a slave of different ethnicity and was quickly a target for accusations. She was accused of attracting young girls like Abigail and Betty with enchanting stories of sexual encounters with demons, swaying men's minds, and fortune-telling which stimulated the young girls' imaginations. While Tichuba had denied her involvement in causing the afflictions or any witchcraft, she oddly revised her statement and confessed to having worked with the devil. It was most likely that she was coerced into changing her statement by Reverend Samuel Paris. All three women were brought before a magistrate and interrogated for several days, starting on March 1st, 1692. Both Sarah Osborne and Good maintained their innocence, but Tijuba confessed to committing witchcraft, citing that the devil came to me and bid me serve him. She also accused the other two defendants as accomplices of witchcraft to save herself from hanging by the magistrate court. After their conviction, the trial's reception caused a ripple effect throughout Salem, creating a paranoia environment that fueled the hysteria within the community. In this atmosphere, tensions were high amongst the average Salem resident and watched those who could potentially be a witch. When a finger is eventually raised and the accused are arrested, the next sentencing won't be as soft as the first trial as it would ultimately cost the lives of residents, many of whom would turn out to be innocent. After some point in mid-late March of 1692, the witch hysteria spurred additional accusations. Much like the previous trial, these individuals were accused by young girls. These included Martha Curry, Dorothy Good, Rebecca Nurse, and Rachel Clinton. What's different about these accused women was that two out of the four accused were respected Salem residents, namely Martha Curry and Rebecca Nurse. Their reputable status within the community was placed into question and created a false narrative that anyone within Salem could be a witch regardless of who they were. Under this false narrative, additions to the accused were not only applicable to those vulnerable, but now to those who were well respected and had influence within Salem. Martha was very outspoken about the first trial's credibility, mainly the testimonial accuracy of Betty Paris and Abigail Williams. While Martha asserted her position about the testimonies and trial, this alone resulted in her being accused by several young girls of witchcraft. 
Rebecca Nurse was the other accused woman who had a high esteemed reputation within the community, known for her annual church attendance along with her husband, Francis Nurse, who was also considered reputable. She was accused of witchcraft after a complaint made by Edward and John Putnam, the same powerful Putnam family that made similar accusations on Sarah Osborne months prior. However, unlike those who were accused, Salem residents actually petitioned to testify Rebecca's innocence. While the jury initially concluded a non-guilty verdict against her, they were told to reconsider their judgement, resulting in the verdict being changed to guilty. A second attempt to petition Rebecca's innocence was made so by Governor Phipps, who had pardoned her for alleged accusations. However, like the verdict being changed earlier, Phipps had reversed his order after several men from Salem persuaded him to do so. After being found guilty by the court for witchcraft during Sarah Good's incarceration, she gave birth to her daughter, Dorothy Good. Like her mother, Sarah Good, Dorothy was accused of practicing witchcraft in a complaint filed by the Putnam family. She was arrested only three days after her mother was placed on trial for witchcraft, and unfortunately for Sarah Good, she falsely confessed to witchcraft after breaking down crying, which sadly incriminated her own mother. As insurmountable cases of witchcraft rampant within Salem, and eventually outside across New England, Governor William Phipps established a special court of Oyer and Terminer on May 27, 1692. The court's purpose was to investigate witchcraft allegations within the regions of Suffolk, Essex, and Middlesex counties. One noticeable case of witchcraft outside of Salem was Rachel Clinton, who was the only person to be accused outside of the Salem community. Several people testified against Rachel, including a girl named Mary Fuller, who proclaimed that she had caused the death of a neighbor by simply passing her. With all the accused listed, albeit some are not named here due to their charges acquitted, there was the question among lawmakers of whether the charges against an alleged witch could be upheld or sufficient enough for punishment. As cases of witchcraft continued, the majority of those found guilty are sentenced with less severe punishments such as imprisonment. However, by June 8, 1692, lawmakers within Massachusetts passed a decree that would permit those found guilty of witchcraft by a court to be sentenced to death by hanging. The passage of this law would have significant consequences for the witch hysteria, setting a dark chapter in New England and Salem's history. Two days after this law had passed, Bridget Bishop was sentenced to death after being convicted. Her death was considered to be the first hanging in the witch trials and took place somewhere in Salem that would later be renamed as Gallows Hill. Following her death, the hysteria escalated as many more were hanged, and those who believed their innocence signed a petition on behalf of the accused. Death sentences for the accused almost became standard for any verdict for a witch accusation, thus resulting in 19 hangings being carried out between July and September of 1692. It's important to note that this did not include Giles Corey's death, Martha Corey's husband who was crushed to death after he refused to plead. Shortly after his death, his wife was hanged three days later on September 22nd, 1692. As an era comes and goes, it makes one assume that once a flame ignites and expands, it slowly extinguishes itself out. As mentioned earlier, the hysteria has caused many to question those around them, regardless of their background and status. This affected not only the average middle class Puritans, but to those who were wealthy and influential. When the accused are placed in a courtroom, proof of witchcraft would often be omitted or subjected through a series of tests using spectral evidence. Spectral evidence has been widely used as a critical piece of evidence, although considered controversial, in most trials as a form of verification that the accused has aligned themselves with the devil or possess supernatural abilities. On June 15th, Cotton Mather wrote a letter to the Oyer and Terminal Courts that spectral evidence should not be taken in as evidence and urged that proceedings be speedy. <laughs> now, you may think his letter was simply ignored by the Oyer and Terminal Courts, but what actually happened was that they've taken the letter into consideration. And when I say consideration, they simply ignored the spectral evidence to be admissible and followed that trials should be speedy. Nice. Further attempts were made by Increase Mather, the father of Cotton Mather on October 3rd, who denounced the use of spectral evidence within witch trials. In one of his publications concerning spectral evidence, the Cases of Conscience, 
Increase argued that it were better that ten suspected witches should escape than that one innocent person should be condemned. In other words, those who are condemned as a witch should be treated as an innocent woman, as an innocent woman should be treated as a witch. While it is true that Increase's argument was a factor in the suspension and halt of further arrest in the witch trials, and the totally not partisan connections with the court judges who Increase was friends with, there was another prominent reason for this occurrence. Weeks after the arrests were halted on October 29th, Governor Phipps suspended the witch trials indefinitely, releasing those who were accused and dissolving the court entirely after his wife was accused as a witch. The court of Oyer and Terminer was eventually replaced with the Superior Court of Judicature, but under a new proceeding that disallowed spectral evidence to be taken as proof. Under these new proceedings, only 3 out of the 56 accused were condemned as a result. While it may seem to many that the nightmare may have ended, Salem's witch trials have continued to be a dark chapter for the community. It has unfortunately shown us the dangers and the consequences of false accusations and convictions against those who proclaimed innocence. Nineteen lives in total were lost during the hysteria, with many assumed to have been executed in Gallows Hill. 200 people were accused of practicing the devil's magic, and many more unfortunate deaths occurred while in jail within the span of 1692. As of writing this script, it's been 323 years since the Salem Witch Trials, and while we're in a society where a dark chapter like this cannot be repeated in the present, we are still living in a world where false convictions are an unfortunate occurrence in our modern day history. Whatever the case may be, a false claim of witch accusation or merely observing a person with supernatural abilities, scrutiny is the utmost importance of discovering the truth. But if the truth becomes clouded by the accused's personal bias, then what are we to say that we are merely carrying nothing more than the devil's work? <laughs>